All right, pull out your Bibles this morning. We're going to start today in the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians chapter 4. And uh, I want to start out by asking this question. Are you hungry? <laughs> Some of you are thinking, well, I didn't have breakfast, so yes, I'm hungry. But no, last week I talked about how the Samaritan woman, she was hungry. She didn't quite know yet what she was hungry for. She was hungry for, for spiritual things, right? And she was waiting for the Messiah. And at that moment, she failed to realize the Messiah was, was right there. But then after that encounter, she, she began to realize, and she said, she said to others, could this be the Messiah, right? She was hungry. Are you hungry? Are you hungry to grow spiritually? Are you hungry to see other people grow spiritually? Are you hungry to come alongside those people and help them? What is your approach to church? Is it just, oh man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come and show up and go through the motions because that's what I've done for years and that's what my parents did before me and my, my grandparents? Or are you coming with expectation? Are you coming ready to receive what the Holy Spirit has for you? Are you coming ready to receive God's word? Are you coming ready to be discipled and are you coming ready to disciple others? Are you inviting others? Are you hungry to see God's kingdom grow? Last week I talked about being outside of Eden, and I just, um, mics are going everywhere today. They're not in my hand, so they're just falling all over the floor. They, all right, well, anyway. I was going to tell a joke, but it was going to be a dad joke, so I figured I'd... I talked last week about being outside of Eden. We are outside of Eden. When you think about it that way, you desire to be in Eden. You desire for everything to be perfect. You, you desire the perfection of the garden, right? But we're not in that. And so sometimes we feel like, well, what's going on? Why, why do I deal with struggle? And, and why do all these things happen in my life? And we have this mentality like we want to be in Eden because that's where God created us to be. But we're in a fallen world that is affected by sin. But there's good news. So this is going to be a three-part series. I started last week with Outside of Eden. Next week is going to be Outside of Eden but Thankful. We're thinking about thankfulness this time of year. This week is going to be outside of Eden, but growing. There's good news. We're outside of Eden. But we still have the opportunity to know God. We still have the opportunity to grow in our faith and in relationship with him. That's good news, amen? We have the Ability to know God, to have a relationship with him. Because of the work done on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, Jesus went to the cross, paid the price for our sins. God is just, he could not look on sin, but now that the price has been paid, we can receive his free gift of grace. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But then it doesn't stop there. That, we're talking about the justification process, right? We're justified by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. You know, think about that for a moment. We're justified by what? Grace. grace through faith in Jesus Christ. So often I hear people say, well, I'm justified by my faith. Wrong. You are not justified by your faith because if you were justified by your faith, you'd be, you'd be able to boast because you would be doing something. 
to earn your salvation, but we don't do anything to earn our salvation. It's through grace alone. We are justified by grace, his grace, through faith in Jesus Christ. So do you have a desire to grow? Are you hungry to grow? Ephesians 4.1, I asked you to turn there. I'm not going to read the whole chapter. I'm going to start with verse 1, and I'm going to go to verse 11. So I'm going to do verse 1 through 4, and then jump to verse 11 of Ephesians chapter 4. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Jump to verse 11. And he gave the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. He's talking about these ministries that he gave in the church and what is the goal here? That we all attain unity in the faith, that we all become mature. What does that imply? That we all grow. That we grow together. You remember last week? It was heard that Jesus was baptizing more than John, right? But then what did it say? Not, and then it, it had this kind of side note. Well, not Jesus, but actually his disciples. See, Jesus was teaching his followers to do the work of the ministry, to proclaim the gospel, to go out, proclaim the gospel, baptize. That's why they were able to continue to do that after Jesus' death on the cross, resurrection, and ascension into heaven. I've got news for you guys. You're not all going to be here forever. I'm not going to be here forever. One of two things is going to happen. Either Jesus is going to come back, which we're all waiting for, and we're all going to be raptured, those who know him, or you're going to die. And you're going to pass on that way. But I, I have this question for you. Are you making your own personal growth a priority, your spiritual growth? And are you making the spiritual growth of others a priority? We need to be. It's what we're called to do. We need to be making that a priority. I want to show you this. Because so often... People, people say, oh, well, pastor, I would serve in the church, but I just don't feel like I, I'm spiritually mature enough. Or I would serve in the church, but I really, you know, I don't know where I would fit in. Or I, I would serve in the church, but I just, I still deal with all these things, and I feel like people would judge me. The good news is God meets people right where they're at. God is willing to meet you right where you're at. I have this card from my daughter, Aurora. And it's, pretty good. it's a pretty good size, so I'll show it to you. You can see the, the picture she drew. And she said, she wrote out, I love daddy, right? And then there's more pictures. She told me this is a snowman. And uh, I'm not really sure what this is, but. <laughs> and then she wrote, I love you, Daddy, a second time. But she figured I already got the message the first time, so she wrote it a little quicker that time. And it's a little harder to make out, right? Now, this card, it, it's beautiful, isn't it? It's a beautiful gift that she, she gave to me. And, you know, I don't look at this card and say, 
Like, I didn't receive it from Aurora and go, well, Aurora, you know, your letters, they need to be in a straight line. Your E, you need a, you need a nicer loop on that E. Daddy's legible, but barely. And, uh, well, let's just say you're not going to get into art school anytime soon, honey. I didn't do that. I would never do that. Why? That would be ridiculous for me to expect her to, you know, have a, a professional portrait on the front of it. It would be ridiculous for me to expect her to have perfect letters at three years old. Right? She's three, right? Yeah, sometimes I lose track. <laughs> <laughs> Her birthday's on Thanksgiving. <laughs> right? It would be ridiculous for me to expect perfection from her. But I'm happy that she simply did her best and she did something to express her love to me. Right? I'm thankful for that. And I cherish it. Our Heavenly Father is the same way. He's the same way. He doesn't expect perfection out of you. What he looks at is the heart. Do you have a heart for the things of God? Do you have a heart that desires to please him? That's what the Father looks at. One theologian said it this way, and we, we're not quite sure who to credit it to, but it's pretty good. The line goes, Lord, I don't always know how to please you, but I believe my desire to please you pleases you. We don't always get it right, do we? And I'm not just talking about Sin, that's a, that's a component, that's something we deal with, right? And we fall short sometimes and we have to repent. But even when you think about things like, you know, our, our theology and, and all this stuff. And you know what? Everybody has their theology and everybody thinks all of their theology is 100% correct. You know? But God's not looking at that. It's not a competition. What we should do is dig into God's word, strive to grow more and more into the image of Christ. And you know what? We're not going to be right about everything all the time, but our desire to look more and more like Jesus, that heart, that's what he's looking at. When we don't get life perfect all the time, that's okay. God's looking at the heart. So what is your heart saying? Man, I'm just dropping. It's a good thing I keep spares. I guess I know that I'm prone to do that. What is your heart saying to God? Is it saying that you have a desire to please him? Is it saying that you have a de desire to grow more and more into the image of him, of our Heavenly Father, of Jesus? Is it saying that you have a desire to see others grow? Is it saying that you're willing to serve and do whatever it takes to see his kingdom grow? God meets us right where we are. Continuing to grow is important, however. Continuing to grow. In this, we're talking about the sanctification process or some would call it spiritual formation. So when we've made a decision for Christ, we've been justified by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, but we're still not perfect, right? Only Jesus is perfect. So we're outside of Eden trying to go about our Christian walk. And it's hard sometimes. It's hard when we're tempted to do the wrong thing, right? 
Sometimes it's hard to do the right thing, even when nobody else is looking. It's hard sometimes to have the discipline to be in God's word every day, to be in prayer every day, to be striving to look more and more like him. That's hard sometimes, but it's important. It's important that we prioritize the things of God because when we talk about this hurting and dying and fallen world, we are in it, but we are not of it. Our focus should be on the things of God. You know, so often in our culture, we, uh, I should say in, in the church world, we try to oversimplify things all the time. But you know what? God meets people right where they are. And a lot of times we, we look at issues in our culture and we try to, we try to oversimplify them. When we're doing that, we're looking at the issue, and we're not looking at the person. And Jesus looks at the person. That's what I'm saying when I say God meets us right where we are. Jesus looks at the person. So when we come across people, even within the church, without, uh, from outside the church, Either way, when we come across people and, and we have disagreements and, you know, we have problems with the way they do things, we have problems with their worldview, and we say, well, that, that's not a biblical worldview. My worldview is the perfect biblical worldview. Don't we say that, right? When we do that, we're not reflecting Christ because Jesus meets people right where they are. So what we should do instead is have healthy conversations. When we minister to our neighbors and our friends, we should have love and compassion for them the same way Jesus does. Because if we suddenly become judgmental and say, oh, well, you're doing it all wrong. Let me tell you the right way you need to do it. If that's, what, that's the attitude we take, right outside the gate, and if we take the attitude that I'm right, you're wrong all the time, we completely slam the door shut on any opportunity to minister to people and to reach people. Have conversations with people. Don't see the issue. See the person just like Jesus does. Learn about their story. Why do they do the things they do? doesn't make sense to us, but maybe if we would just listen to their story, we might understand a little better. Why do they believe the way they believe? Well, just listen to their story. Maybe you'll understand better. In doing that, you're opening doors of opportunity to share your story, to share the gospel, to share the hope that you have in Jesus. That's talking about it from an outside the church context, Let's, which hopefully we're getting outside the four walls of the church, amen? And building relationships and having an impact in our community. Now let's talk about inside the church, that context, when we disagree with people. Do we immediately rush, rush to judgment? Do we take issue with someone and then go over, instead of talking to them about it, talk to somebody else and gossip about them? You know, gossip is a sin. God's word makes that very clear. And so often in church world, for some reason, we act like, well, it's not, well, sure, it's a sin, but it's, oh, come on, it can't be that bad of one. It is. So what are we doing? Are we talking about others to somebody else, or are we talking with each other? Are we having conversations? Are we studying God's word together? Are we praying with one another? Are we growing in unity? Are we growing in our faith together? That's what we need to be doing, church. And when people see that happening inside the church, that's signs of a healthy church. 
that's a place where God can really move in an incredible way. And when people see the Holy Spirit moving, they're going to be drawn to that. Let's make sure people see the Holy Spirit moving in this church. Amen? Let's make sure we are a healthy church. Let's make sure we are kingdom thinkers. And so now, I have a question for you. How did your spiritual assessments go? Your emotional maturity assessments go? You're thinking, oh man, I totally forgot about that thing. Some of you did it, right? If you didn't, that's okay, but I hope you still have it, and I encourage you to do it. And it's not something that you're going to share with other people. It's for you. Be honest as you go through your assessment. Score it. See where your weaker points are. See where your stronger points are, where you could maybe come alongside other people and help them in their walk with the Lord. But in order to grow outside of Eden, we need to do three things. Number one, we need to know where we are. That assessment's going to help you. You need to know where you're at. You need to be honest about where you're at. Don't keep things inside. You can have honest conversations in prayer, in your time with the Lord. God knows the hurts that you've been through, and he cares. He's not forgotten. Speaking of oversimplifying, another thing we often tend to to oversimplify in church world is forgiveness. Forgiveness is important and we need to forgive. But sometimes we take this attitude like, well, you just got to forgive and go on and that's that. Right? And so we, we tend to oversimplify that issue. And again, it's important to forgive, but you've got to remember this. You still have to heal from the hurts that you've faced in the past. And God has not forgotten the hurts that you have been through. God has not forgotten the struggles that you have been through. He cares for you. He has the ability to help you heal. So have open conversations with God. David did. You ever read the Psalms? You can have open conversations with God. You can be honest about your feelings, about the things that you've been through. He has the ability to heal you. So we have to know where we are. We have to know where we want to go. And we have to know how we're going to get there. Where do we want to go? We want to look like Jesus. Now, we're never going to look exactly like Jesus. We're never going to be perfect. He's the only one who has ever walked this earth who's perfect. But as we talk about this sanctification process or spiritual formation, we can look to him through his word, through God's word, through prayer. We can look to him and strive to be more and more like him each and every day. Luke 2.52, how do we grow? Jesus set such a great example, didn't he? Uh, I hope you believe Jesus set a great example. He set a great example for us, didn't he, church? And you know, Luke 2.52 says this, And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Now, Jesus was perfect. He never sinned. But he was fully God and fully man when he was on the earth. And he did have a childhood. And he did grow up. And he increased in wisdom in stature, 
in favor with God and man. That's talking about pretty much every kind of growth, right? Physical growth, growth of, in knowledge, it, it, growing in, in maturity. He demonstrated that for us. This is the example we should follow. Some people would say, well, why is emotional maturity important? Jesus demonstrated it. Demonstrated it. Grew in favor with God and man. Now, what is the context of this verse? It's right after Jesus, a young boy at this time, was lost by his parents, by Mary and Joseph. Now, you think parenting is hard for you. Now, if you have small kids, you know that you have to have eyes on them all the time. You take your eyes off them for one second and they're destroying something or they're finding some sort of trouble to get into, right? And you, got, you guys know, and even if you, whether you have kids, small children now, or whether, you, you know, your kids are grown, you could remember this from when you raised them. You know that moment when you're like in the store and it's, it's like real quiet. It's real quiet. And you t- turn and you look and your kid is not there. What happens? You have this like sinking feeling, right? If there was anything else on your mind at that moment, it's not on your mind anymore. And, and you kind of go into to panic, right? Now think about this. Mary has lost Jesus, the Son of God. And she begins to realize that. And imagine how scary this had to be because they were already quite a distance from Jerusalem and she's like she's got to be like I I don't know where he is and then you know she probably starts asking around like yeah has anybody seen Jesus that their relatives were with them right so she probably starts asking among the relatives like have you seen Jesus where's Jesus I don't know where Jesus is and then people are like well he hasn't been with us the whole time since we left I don't know what you're talking about Mary right and you imagine the panic, the panic that is setting in, right? She has lost the Son of God. Eventually, she's probably going around like, Jesus, my, my, my child, Jesus, have you seen him? He is the Son of God. All of humanity depends on him. And I have lost him. Can you help me find him? Right? And where was he? They go back, they travel back. That had to be hard too. They had to travel a whole nother day, not knowing what was going to happen here. And where is Jesus? He's at the temple. Right? And what does he say to her? Didn't you know that I would have to be about my father's business? And then it goes right into this, that Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. We have to know where we want to go. Do you want to look more and more like Jesus? Do you want to look more and more like him? Are you striving to look more and more like him each and every day? And then finally, we have to know how to get there. And there's, there's a lot of ways. I could spend a lot of time on this. But I want to focus in on this for today as I wind this down. And you can turn in your Bibles if you'd like to Luke 22, 24 to 27. How do we look more and more like Jesus? Through servanthood under Christ.
So we have to know where we are. Do your assessment. We have to know where we want to go. Where do we want to go? We want to look more and more like Jesus. We have to know how to get there. How do we get there? Through servanthood under Jesus, under Christ Jesus. In other words, taking up our cross daily, as his word tells us to, that means sacrificial living, following him, and instead of putting ourselves first, putting others first. That's what Jesus demonstrated for us. Instead of it all being about us, first and foremost, it should be about him. And then from there, instead of putting ourselves first, we need to put others first. We need to love God and love people. Jesus said all the laws and the prophets could be summed up in that. Just love God and love people. Let's look at Luke 22 for a minute. I have some time left because I love this. Luke 22, 24, a dispute arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as one who serves. Think about this. The disciples are having an argument about which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. Now, we look at the, the disciples many times in Scripture as we read the Gospels and we think to ourselves, ha! Those people are ridiculous. They don't have any idea, do they? No sense whatsoever. Peter's always running his mouth. The others don't listen to Jesus. And that's kind of our human nature, right? We cast judgment. We fail to realize that we do the same things, don't we? Even if you're not doing it verbally, you're contemplating in your mind sometimes or you're at least tempted to, uh, to contemplate in your mind sometimes about how important you are, right? By nature, we're selfish people. That's why we have to crucify the flesh, right? If we're to follow Jesus and more, look more and more like him. So we can't act like, ah, the disciples are messing it up again. We do the same thing. But think about when this is happening. If you look in Luke 22, what has just happened is Jesus has had the last supper with them, and he's telling them that he's about to be betrayed and that the betrayer is among them. And their reaction to all of this the Last Supper, Jesus saying, hey, you know that thing I told you about where I'm going to go to the cross for your I'm going to die for your sins? That's about to happen. I'm about to be betrayed. So enjoy this Last Supper. Always do this in remembrance of me. And their reaction to that is they, they go, first they start like, well, surely it's not going to be me who betrays Jesus. And then that develops into this argument of, I'm the greatest among all of us. Do you see the problem here? Do you see how when we let our selfish human nature take control, it can look really ridiculous? This is why emotional maturity and spiritual growth is so important. Mark 10, 45 for even the Son of Man came not to be served, 
but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. And he served during his ministry, during his time on the earth, he served. And he did the ultimate service for all of us when he went to the cross willingly for our sins. Our God loves us, cares for us so much he sent his only son to die on the cross for our sins. Jesus went to that cross willingly, the ultimate act of service. And that's who we look to. When we talk about spiritual formation and spiritual growth, that's who we're looking for. And that's who we're striving to be more and more like, is Jesus. Rick, if you'll come on up in the close. I would just like everyone to bow your heads. Close your eyes. I want to just give you an opportunity if you're here today and you've never made the decision to make Jesus Lord of your life or maybe you did make that decision at one time but you've since fallen away I just want to take a moment wait on the Holy Spirit and if that's you if you want to make a decision to follow Jesus today just lift up your hand every head bowed every eye closed this, this time is just between you and God I'm the only one who's looking to know who we're praying with but if you want to make a decision to follow Jesus, just lift up your hand so that I know who we're praying with. 